Um, I, I don't know how long it will be because uh, we might uh, digress. But the way in which Jesus fulfilled the Jewish feasts really is a fascinating study. In the Hebrew scriptures, uh, the prophet Amos records that, that God would do nothing unless he revealed it to his prophets first. Mm. Amos 3, 7. Please note. Amos 3, 7. nothing unless he reveals a secret to his servants the prophets all right from the old covenant to the new genesis to revelation god provides a picture after picture of his entire plan for mankind one of the most startling prophetic pictures that we have seen up to date is leviticus 23 <coughs> The Hebrew word for feasts is Moadim, which is literally appointed times, and that tells you that it's a plural. Okay? Moadim. Literally means appointed times. God has carefully planned and orchestrated the timing and sequence of each of these seven feasts to reveal to us a special story. The seven annual feasts are spread over seven months. And they're set at the appointed times for, by God. They are still celebrated by observant Jews today, but both Jews and non-Jews who have placed their faith in the Jewish Messiah, Yeshua, these special days demonstrate the work of redemption through Him. The first four of the seven feasts occur during the springtime, as we studied. Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and weeks. They have all been fulfilled in Christ. And the first, uh, the final three holidays, trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles, occurred during the autumn, all within a short 15 day period. Many Bible scholars believe that these autumn feasts have not been fulfilled as yet. <coughs> However, the hope for all believers is that Jesus Christ will come and most assuredly fulfill the feasts. As the four spring feasts were fulfilled literally to the day, one would imagine that the three final feasts will be filled literally to the day. In a nutshell, here is the prophetic significant significance of each of the seven Levitical feasts of Israel. Number one, Passover. Leviticus 23, 5. It 
Okay. These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which he shall proclaim in their seasons. Leviticus 23.5 In the fourteenth day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. It pointed <coughs> to the Messiah as our Passover lamb. 1 Corinthians 5.7 Please die. Seven. One Corinthians five verse seven. seven. Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you are truly unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. We understand that His blood will be shed for our sins. Jesus was crucified on the day of preparation for the Passover, at the same hour that the lambs were being slaughtered for the Passover meal that evening. Yeah? We're going to look at that a little bit. John 19, 14. John 19, 14. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. Now we understand the preparation day is the day that for, for us on which the Passover occurs. Yeah? But seeing as they start at six in the evening, to six in the evening, that's how their day runs. The preparation day would be three o'clock in the afternoon, then, then they would slaughter the lamb and then eat it that evening. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So it would be preparation day and then they would slaughter the lamb and then the Passover they would eat it that evening. So the next feast was unleavened bread, tw uh, Leviticus 23 verse 6. <coughs> Leviticus 23, verse 6. Then on the fifteenth day of the same month, there is the feast of unleavened bread to the Lord. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. Now, obviously this pointed to the Messiah's sinless life. Leaven is always a picture of sin. In fact, if you go to Matthew 13 and look at the parables, you get the woman who needs leaven into the three measures of meal. In Matthew 13, it's, but, but you don't need to turn to it. But we understand that the woman is evil because there are two women in the Bible, basically the bride and the woman, yeah? And she's kneading evil into the three measures of meal, which is the offering to the Lord. So she's, uh, she's kneading evil into it. Okay. In the New Testament, leaven stands for five things. Now we've done it before, but let's quickly go through it again for Rosie, because I don't think she's done it before. Everybody re remembers, don't they? Yeah, okay. <laughs> it's in there somewhere. It's a five minute. <laughs> the first one. Hypocrisy. Oh, yeah. See. Okay. Luke 12, verse 1. <coughs> Luke 12, verse 1. In the meantime, 
when an innumerable multitude of people had gathered together so that they trampled one another, he began to say to his disciples, first of all, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. So, okay, the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. The Pharisees were the epitome of hypocrisy, with their long prayer shawls and their loud prayers. They imagined that their wealth, wealth demonstrated approbation from God. It's amusing, actually, that the modern church also considers their wealth uh, is, is a, a sign of approbation from God. And the second one Rationalism. Rationalism. Matthew 16, 6. We'll be back to Neville. Is it? Then Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Matthew 6.12. Maybe 16.12. It's 16.12, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Then understood they how that he bade them not to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. The teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees was rationalism. This is still the main teaching of the modern liberal church, <coughs> where reason becomes the ultimate authority of our beliefs. And thus, anything that doesn't uh, appear to be reasonable is rejected. Consequently, miracles are rejected. Because they don't appear to be reasonable. And so, they are rejected. Alright, the third one, we're just giving an overview, is worldliness. Worldliness, and that's Mark 8.15. Then he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, and the leaven of Herod. The Pharisees and Herod were worldly in their outlook. Herod especially was worldly in his outlook. The Pharisees loved to be exalted and looked up and, and, and looked up to, considering themselves to be so righteous. Herod so ignored the word of God that he married his brother's wife, which was against the law. And of course, when John the Baptist accused him, John the Baptist lost his head. Number four is evil conduct. One Corinthians five, six, <coughs> seven, eight. One Corinthians five, six, seven, and eight. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. 
The Corinthian church is criticized by Paul for their practice during their love feasts and breaking of bread. Every time we break bread, we read a section of what he wrote there. But, in fact, if you start at verse 17, instead of starting at verse 23 of 1 Corinthians 11, you will find that he actually is castigating the church. Paul is also constantly telling us to put off the old man and put on the new man made in the image of Christ. You'll find consequently he's constantly referring to the my mind's gone black. He's constantly referring to the covenant where he is saying, put off the old man, put on the new man. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> and the fifth thing we need to look at um, the, the, the end of round of night, but it doesn't matter. False doctrine. Galatians 5, 7 to 9. Galatians 5, 7 to 9. You were running sorry, you were running well. Who hindered who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion did not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. The Galatian church had accepted the false doctrines of the Judaizers, another heresy which is so prevalent today. <coughs> Jesus' body was in the grave during the first days of this feast, like a kernel of wheat, planted and waiting to burst forth as the bread of life. And so we come to first fruits, the next feast, which, was, which took place on the day after the Sabbath, after Passover, was first fruits. Leviticus 23.10 Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I give to you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. This pointed to the Messiah's resurrection as the first fruits of the righteous. Jesus was resurrected this very day, which is one of the reasons that Paul refers to him as the first fruits from the dead. Mm -hmm. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. 1 Corinthians 15, 20, way back to... Yep. Yep. Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so we go on to the fourth feast, which was weeks of Pentecost. Okay. Leviticus 23 16. Even unto the morrow, after the seventh Sabbath, shall ye number fifty days, and ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. This occurred fifty days after the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and pointed to the great harvest of souls. 
the gift of the Holy Spirit was given for both Jew and Gentile who would be brought into the kingdom of God during the church age. This is related for us in Acts chapter 2. When you read the whole of chap chapter 2, which we're not going to do right now, you understand. The church was actually established on this day when God poured out his Holy Spirit and 3,000 Jews responded to Peter's great sermon and his first proclamation of the gospel. They're the spring feasts. So now they've been fulfilled. We've seen them fulfilled. Uh, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and Pentecostal weeks we have seen fulfilled. However, we need to come on to trumpets, which has not been fulfilled yet. And we dealt with this last week, or the week before. Leviticus 23, 24. of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing trumpets, a holy convocation. What was <coughs> peculiar about that day? I've told you twice now. They didn't actually know that it was going to happen. They didn't know when it was going to happen. In fact, it was the day was referred to as no man knows the day or the hour. Why? Because they didn't know when the moon was going to rise. Yeah. Simply because if there was cloud cover, they wouldn't see it. Okay. Here's the first of the autumn feasts. Many believe that this day points to the rapture of the church when Jesus will appear in the heavens as he comes for his bride. I'm not going to argue, argue about it. Let's say many believe. Okay. The rapture is always associated in scripture with the blowing of a loud trumpet. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. Please, Diana. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from the heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord, Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Rosie, 1 Corinthians 15, 52. 1 Corinthians 15, 52. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Okay, so that is, uh, if you like, the Feast of Trumpets. It's, it's sort of lining up to the Feast of Trumpets. When the, in the moment, at the last trump, the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible. Okay. Ten days later, we have the Day of Atonement, Leviticus 23, 27. Leviticus 23, 27.
twenty three, twenty seven. Yeah. Also, the tenth day of this of this seventh month shall be the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. Now, many believe that this <coughs> prophetically points to the day of the second <coughs> coming of Jesus. When he will return to the earth. That will be the day of atonement for the Jewish remnant when they look upon him they have pierced. Repent of their sins and receive him as the Messiah. Zechariah 12.10 Zechariah 12.10 Pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look upon then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, and grieve for him as one as one grieves for a firstborn. Okay. Romans eleven one to six. Romans 11, 1 to 6. And I say then, had God cast away his people, God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham and of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What ye, what ye not, what the scripture hath of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed th thy prophets, and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself seven thousand men, who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then, at this present time, also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace then it is and and if by grace then it is it not more of works, otherwise grace is not more grace. But if it be of works, then it is then is it not more grace, otherwise work is not more work. Very difficult. Romans 11, 25 to 36. <coughs> Romans 11, 25 to 36. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written. The Deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them, when I take away their sins. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For as you were once disobedient to God, yet have now obtained mercy through their disobedience, even so these also have now been disobedient, that through the mercy shown you, they also may be obtain mercy. For God has committed them all to disobedience, that he might have mercy on all. O oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God! <coughs> How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways, past finding out! 
for who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has become his counsellor, or who has first given to him, <coughs> and it shall be repaid to him. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory for ever. Amen. <coughs> Just trumpets. Mm. And finally, tabernacles or booths or succor. Okay. Leviticus 23, 34. <coughs> Leviticus 23, 34. <coughs> Speak to the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of this seventh month shall be the feast of tabernacles for seven days to the Lord. Many scholars believe that this feast day points to the Lord's promise that he will once again tabernacle with his people when he returns to reign over all the world. Now, we understand that there's a few days between um, Atonement, the Day of Atonement, and Tabernacles, yeah? So, if the Lord returns on Atonement, <coughs> and therefore the Jewish people cry out and recognise him, yeah? What does he do in the intervening days? when he sets up and, and begins ruling the world. When they go down to what it's called now. Bosra. Mm. Yeah. Sorry, what was that in the sense? When he comes, first of all, we've got to understand <coughs> that Israel is in a terrible mess. In fact, they're just about conquered and they're just about to be wiped out and they cry out to the Lord and in that moment which is what the Lord has been waiting for for them to cry out he will appear and lead them triumphantly back to Jerusalem so that will take about four days, mm. I would imagine. And then mm. he sets to and tabernacles with his people. Yeah? yeah. Micah 4 1 to 4 7. Micah 4 1 to 4 7. <coughs> To seven, did you yeah. Say? Right, and it will, <laughs> and it will come about in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and the people will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, "Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, and to the house of the of the God of Jacob, that He may teach us about His ways." And that he may walk in his, we may walk in his paths. <coughs> For from Zion <coughs> will go forth the law, even the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he will judge between many peoples and render decisions for mighty distant nations. Then they will hammer their swords into the plowshares, and they will their spears into the pruning hooks. Nation will not li lift up sword against nation. And never again will, will they train for war. Each of them will sit under his vine and under his fig tree, with no one to make them afraid. For the, from, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. 
Through all his peoples walk each in the name of his God. <coughs> As for us, we will walk in the name of our of the Lord our God forever and ever. In that day, declares the Lord, I will assemble the lame and gather the outcasts, even those whom, whom I have afflicted. I will make the lame a remnant and the outcasts a strong nation, and the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from now on and forever. Okay. So let's ask, should Christians celebrate these Levitical feast days of Israel today. Well, whether or not a Christian celebrates the Jewish feast days would be a matter of conscience for the Christian. Yeah, Colossians 2, 16 and 17. <coughs> So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, or the substances of Christ. Okay. Christians are not bound to observe the Jewish feasts the way an Old Testament Jew was. But we shouldn't criticise another believer who does not observe these special days or does observe these special days. Yeah? Romans 14, verse 5. Romans 14, verse 5. <coughs> I wish you all. Uh, oh, sorry. Romans 14. Romans. Yeah. Try Romans. Yes, <laughs> the pages don't turn so well. <laughs> one person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. <coughs> Now, while it is not required for Christians to celebrate the Jewish feast days, I would say it is extremely desirable for people to study them. Certainly, it would, it, it would be beneficial to celebrate uh, these days if it leads to a greater understanding of what takes place in that day. In fact, we were... Uh, we celebrated a, a, a Passover Seder um, some years ago, which opened our eyes to what goes on. Um, certainly, it produced an extreme dislike for gefilte fish. <laughs> As Christians, if we choose to celebrate these special days, we should put Christ in the center of the celebration. Mm. He's the one yeah. who came to make sure that each one was fulfilled. And he's the one who is coming again to make sure yeah. all the feast days are fulfilled. <coughs> Amen. Any questions? Yeah. And I understand that they really do get excited they dance and sing and really uh, celebrate. It's uh, just thinking. It's like a. But if you were, if the Lord had called you, for instance, to be, uh, you were witnessing to somebody who'd come out of legalism or whatever, or even uh, you know, Messianic Jew, and you were not, you were for, you were emphasising the new covenant, in Christ and grace, it might not be something you'd be getting involved with if you'd learn it yourself, you know, to, so that unless you cause them to stumble. But then if you I like your example like you said, for us to learn it and understand yeah. it. Yeah. Without it being a you know, just to you know 
uh, if we knew, it was a real blessing if you knew Messianic uh, Jews who understood that it was no law keeping, but they could show you. I mean, that'd be a, you know, how they used to. Well, one of the great things is when you get a Jew who becomes a Messianic or complete Jew, Correct. whatever you want to call it, yeah, yeah. you know, um, they normally see everything because they've got the Old Testament, mm. they're steeped in the Old Testament, and suddenly they see the New Testament, and you get Jacob, who sort of really um, understands, you know. Mm. Um, however, we shouldn't um, denigrate ourselves. We have the New Testament. We don't have a handle on the Old Testament fully. But with these feasts, if we speak to Jewish people and uh, they are celebrating a feast, it's very interesting to turn around and say to them, but do you, un do you understand what this means? Mm. Yeah. And then you can point out from the word exactly what it means. Yeah. And uh, you might be able to lead them to, the, to, 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 to Yeshua. It's very difficult to, it's very easy to do the first four feasts because they've been fulfilled. <laughs> to do the next three mm. is, a, is difficult because we're in the dark, so to speak. Sorry, uh, stumbling uh, through that, I, mm. I don't know. <coughs> Maybe I'm, I need to get more teeth in my mouth or something. There's <laughs> a few words there, that was that one trying to get me. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay.